It's Friday, December 22, 2023. And these are the science and space headlines you need to know now. Equatorial Launch Australia unveiled a new launch pad design. Celebrating 25 years of Australian space law and looking back at the past 12 months. Welcome to the shiny fresh Trexone Studio B. I couldn't wait to next year to show it all off. Equatorial Launch Australia has released the completed designs for its state-of-the-art launch pads, essentially eliminating the need for lengthy configuration changes at each of their seven space launch complexes at the Arnhem Space Centre. For more, ELA's Michael Jones is beaming in. Michael, welcome. What is the significance of the Arnhem Space Centre Advanced Launch Pad, or ASCALP? Um, Matt, we have been designing this for sort of almost a year now, and it's been in concept for quite a while. And one of the things that struck me when I first started in this industry about three years ago was the complete lack of commonality. And, and in a business model where you're trying to go, well, we're going to be a multi-user spaceport, that lack of commonality sort of, sort of made us concerned. So we then decided, and it became the sort of the phrase within the company that we needed in all things space to become the relative Swiss army knife of launch. And so therefore we looked at how do we get rockets on and off the pad? How do we make sure that each rocket launch doesn't destroy the pad? How do we get to the point where we're doing really safe, high cadence launch for um, launch companies who come from the United States, Asia, um, all over Europe um, and no commonality. And therefore, you know, the pad that we've designed basically has a number of key components to it. And, you know, you could sort of do it and go, well, we need to look at the various size and weights of the rocket, and they are quite varied. And particularly when you have liquid fuel and solid fuel rockets, the solid fuel rockets, obviously the booster stages are already preloaded and are quite heavy. There are sort of a, you know, solid fuel varies from a sort of a chalky material to sort of it looks like grey rubber, um, basically, and they're quite heavy. So matching the size and weight was one key characteristics the next one was you know how do we actually manage getting it onto the pad and so there are two elements or probably three elements to that one of which is we needed to have a mechanism to do fine adjustments of a very heavy device you know which is also very long and awkward and how do we then make that to the pad um, and so that gave rise to fixing two problems at once, which was how do we get the rocket from the horizontal integration facility to the pad and then made it. So the rocket trolley um, came into life. And so that's an integral part of the whole exercise. And that is basically a low slung, um, the rocket sits as low as possible, and I'll come back to that in a minute, um, sits in a very low slung trolley, which has a lot of wheels, many of which cast are so that you can get that very fine uh, adjustment. But the whole body of the rocket, uh, of the rocket trolley um, moves up and laterally on a hydraulic program and a very um, precise hydraulic program so that we can mate it to the base of the pad. The next thing is having um, every company has a different mechanism and, and a different method for holding their rocket to the pad. Um, they're generally just big claws that close in and grab the rocket at, right at its base, but they vary from a very frail looking hook system to a very robust sort of block that comes in electrically or hydraulically. And so accommodating all of those um, in whatever shape and, and manner they come was one of the key targets. So having that base plate attached to something that could then easily make to the pad so that gave rise to the next stage of it, which is what we call the interface plate. And that's different for every company. And that's the bit where we do our magic and do the non-recurring engineering of actually making sure that the mating for that um, happens perfectly together. And, uh, you know, we, we then are able to put that into the lifting mechanism and put that onto the pad. So there's, as I said, many, many aspects to this and it all comes together in you know, we hope an elegant solution, but we also then have to look at all the safety stuff, you know, and also the aspects of, um, uh, you know, how do we provide the services that they need, you know, for that. 
Well, Ascalp has been designed as a fully integrated and all-inclusive pad, so that leads to time saved on the ground, I guess, enabling faster turnarounds of launches? Yep, time is money, um, but it's also, um, you know, the availability of people. We can't tie up our people who are servicing potentially seven customers all wanting to get to a high cadence launch. And that's what we've had to do is look ahead and go, if we're doing 50 launches a year, we're launching each week. And if people are doing wet dresses plus live, live launch loads, you know, at least every day there's something happening. So we can't tie people up all day moving and managing, you know, rockets. And whilst that responsibility is primarily on our customers, we will need to provide support to that. And so having a mechanism which allows it to happen elegantly and easily and not stress the rocket and not stress the rocketeers um, is a key part to the whole exercise. So designing it so that it's quick and easy is also, you know, very, you know, there's a, there's a method to that rather than just, oh, it'd be a good idea if we did this quick, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, when might we be seeing the first launch with ASCALP? Um, we will be using one of our pads for a couple of uh, suborbital launches in 24, and our first orbital launch at this stage is slated for 15th of March in 25, and that'll be the first time that we use that in anger. But we'll start testing, you know, on site and qualifying and certifying each of the pads from sort of May onwards. So um, there's, there's, you know, we've got a, we, we've just done all of the final positioning and surveying and now a lot of the construction work is happening and the certification and the and the build work will happen in the new year. All right, well, you saw me note those dates in the calendar. I'm going to see you guys next year. For now, though, Michael, thanks for beaming in. Pleasure. Merry Christmas. Well, this year's Talking Science went on the road twice. I reckon next year we'll be heading to the top end and for a bit of Equatorial Launch Australia action. Well, in 1998, the Australian Parliament passed the Space Activities Act to ensure safe space-related operations and associated activities. It was a time of burgeoning commercial launch service projects in Queensland, South Australia and Christmas Island. The Act even covered the payment of adequate compensation for damage caused to persons or property as a result of space activities, as well as implementing Australia's obligations under the UN space treaties. To address the changing landscape of the space industry over the years, several amendments have been made to the SAA to cover the range of space activities as well as the new participants involved, including smaller emerging businesses and additional involvement by universities. The most significant change came in 2019 when the Parliament passed a bill to rename SAA as the Space Launches and Returns Act. Since then, the Australian Space Agency has fully activated the Act, including a history-making series of launches in the Northern Territory in 2022. A new snapshot of an ancient far-off galaxy could help scientists understand how it formed and the origins of our own Milky Way. Aussie researchers were able to not only capture the motion of the gas around the 12 billion year old galaxy BRI 1335-0417, but also reveal a seismic wave forming, a first in this type of early galaxy. The galaxy's disk, a flattened mass of rotating stars, gas and dust, moves in a way not dissimilar to ripples spreading on a pond after a stone is thrown in. The research team noted that the motion of the disk is due to an external source, either from new gas streaming into the galaxy or by coming into contact with other smaller galaxies. The study has been published in monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. New research has highlighted potential landing sites for life hunting missions to Saturn's moon Enceladus. It's believed that biosignatures detected are coming from subsurface oceans within the world's icy shell. The Cassini spacecraft flew through plumes of material erupting through the surface fissures in 2017, just before its collision course with Saturn. Analysis showed 90% of the larger grains in the material don't actually escape the moon's gravity, instead falling back to the surface, which could be retrieved by a future sample return mission. 
And while surface deposits may make it easier to collect a sample, ultraviolet radiation from the sun may kill off any potential discoveries. So we still need to go ice fishing for the most pristine examples of Enceladus's life. The star-forming region, nicknamed the Running Chicken Nebula, shines brightly in red, pink and blue in a newly released image by the Very Large Telescope in Chile. In the stunning new 1.5 billion pixel snapshot, the wispy gas and dust tendrils of the nebula grow, glow brightly in their festive hues appropriate for release at this time of year. At about 71 light years wide, the running chicken nebula is so named because it looks like a chicken fleeing a cosmic Christmas dinner, according to space.com. Up in the upper right, we were treated to a view of two emission nebulae called GUM39 and GUM40, making up the head of the chicken, while GUM41 is in the lower right, or the chicken's foot. NASA has published this composite image of a regular dwarf galaxy, UGC 8091, from Hubble data collected between 2006 and 2021. 12 filters process the data sampling, uh, sampling it through broad and narrow wavelengths that covered mid-ultraviolet to visible red light. Last month, NASA released a James Webb image which they dubbed the Christmas Tree Galaxy Cluster and the Chandray X-ray Observatory also recently studied a cosmic Christmas tree. And finally this week and this year, let's look back at some of the stories we covered here on Talk and Science. It's been an incredible 12 months, both at home and abroad. We started the year chatting Orion, at Artemis's crew capsule with NASA's Frank Lane. So as a vehicle manager, what I do is I kind of, you know, a lot of people call it like different Come, uh, different part of the, the industry, they call it like, you know, like booster mother or, oh no. So what I do is I watch over the Orion vehicle. You know, when a vehicle is being built, I make sure that it's being built on schedule. I follow it all the way from you know, cradle to grave, um, also throughout the mission. And I'm, you know, I make sure that I don't do the actual work, right? It's a vehicle manager. I kind of oversees, you know, how it's being built. Is it meeting schedule? If it's not meeting schedule, then what's holding it up? Now, what are the issues, the challenges that I need to go ahead and introduce, you know, and essentially intervene, just make sure that we can go over those hurdles and then get the vehicle going again so that we can get it all built on time and to go ahead and meet our mission objectives and milestones. We peered into distant galaxies, Earth's rotation paused, the Chinese spy balloon dropped by the continental United States and an X-class solar flare erupted in the middle of February. We learned more about Australia's contribution to Artemis's missions to the moon in March before we stopped by the World Science Festival and caught up on exoplanet hunting. Now guys, um, you've just come from a, a little bit of a talk about James Webb, um, People have been around and getting all of this science experience. Um, what's it like to be seeing these people out and about and uh, checking everything out? Look, honestly, I'm actually blown away. Um, you know, we've, we've got all this uh, sort of time on radio and, and on your podcast, you know, booked partially to promote our, our, you know, talks for tomorrow. They're sold out. There's no point promoting them. And I'm actually a little bit shocked. <laughs> I'm a little bit shocked, you know, at that. We've, we've sold out two shows on James Webb and Exoplanets at QPAC. They're large theatres. Uh, I'm really, you know, humbled by the the enthusiasm of Brisbane people to uh, to listen to science and talk about science. It is very cool, Jesse. Uh, now you're living in LA at the moment. You're back, uh, but you are a bit of a local as well, I believe. That's right. I grew up in a small town, just a 20 minutes south of Ipswich. Uh, so it's great to be back. And Brisbane has really turned it on for the festival today. It's a gorgeous, if a little bit sticky day. <laughs> it is absolutely incredible. Um, it's March weather. Uh, to quote a Simpsons line, I guess it's smart weather. <laughs> <laughs> um, but James Webb, this telescope, long delayed, uh, so many issues with it, um, finally launching, and we're just getting these discoveries straight away. To either of you, what's that kind of like, just to see all of that blood, sweat and tears finally pay off for everyone? It's really incredible. As you say, it was delayed again and again and again again and at some points it was even cut entirely and had to be rescued from the cutting room floor of the budget at the White House. Uh, but it launched on Christmas Day in 2021 which was just a genuine gift for astronomers and especially exoplanet mm. astronomers and you know since they took the first six months to do the commissioning the data have just been coming down and they're just so much better than we even dreamed mm. and that, that's the really exciting part. In April, we covered the crew announcement of Artemis II and spoke to Glenn Nagel about how Tidbin Biller was prepping for our return to the moon. 
So we started doing planning work for the upgrades we need to do the antennas probably about six years ago now. Uh, you need a lot of lead time. Uh, we're going to be we've been adding new technologies to the antennas, uh, increased bandwidths, higher bandwidths that we'll be using for the Artemis mission, uh, new encryption systems that we'll be putting in because we're going to be carrying carrying human spaceflight data again, as we did in the Apollo days, uh, and uh, making sure that you know we can get on top of things uh, ahead of the game. So because there was a lot of delays with you know the first launch of Artemis One. Uh, you know, we probably pushed back that uh, launch date by about 14 months before we got to the final launch last November. And, uh, yeah, that was good because it gave us, the, uh, in some ways, the additional time <laughs> to actually get those first upgrades done on one of our 34-metre antennas. And now we're in the process of doing all the others. We brought you live coverage of the Ningaloo eclipse before Australia's largest rocket testing facility was greenlit at the end of April. Southern Launch signed a Memorandum of Understanding in May and we dropped by the Australian Space Forum in Adelaide. We've uh, just reached our target of 1,000 delegates again this, this forum and uh, we've made the big announcement that um, uh, every second forum will be in another city and we've already, we're already uh, committed to Sydney on the 6th of December so that will be a big new adventure and challenge for us but we're looking forward to it. So 15 conventions now and uh, 16th moving to another city. What spurred, the, uh, what spurred that decision on? Um, the, the, the need to be seen to be a national foundation, which we are, we always were, um, and um, the uh, feedback we've had from um, our many interstate visitors who enjoy coming to Adelaide, but uh, have often suggested that we should uh, do it in other states. Before June taught us that lightning on Jupiter likely forms the same as here on Earth. Flash forward to August and India lands on the moon, AI finds an asteroid and Olympus Mons may have been girt by sea. Osiris Rex returned to Earth in September and Jason DeWalken beamed in just before his night shift of sample monitoring began. Uh, it's been a busy time and a bit of hair loss, but um, here we are. Uh, it's been an absolutely perfect day. Uh, the capsule came down an amazing location, uh, no issues, no problems, everything's been wonderful. Uh, we got the, uh, uh, the sample canister on, on nitrogen purge, which is used to keep out, out air from getting inside. And um, we're now going through and doing the, the last uh, uh, preparations to get it loaded onto the airplane uh, to fly tomorrow to St. Johnson Space Center to begin the 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 slow, deliberate process of opening up the canister and getting the sample ready for uh, the Star Trek science team and the international science community. And then a few weeks later, the team revealed carbon and water in the sample. Australia and America signed a technology safeguards agreement in November, which paves the way forward for Aussie rocket launches. And we were there as Hypersonics officially unveiled their new facility in Carroll Park, just around the corner from the studio. We've got a contract with the Defence Innovation Unit. We've also got a partnership agreement with Kratos. We've got a fantastic team. Uh, as you can see behind us, we've got the, the life-size model of the, of the Dart, which is our first MVP product. We are in the process of building and assembling that for deployment and launch at the end of next year. And as you can see tonight, we've got a fantastic team of young people who are all very much engaged to, to deliver that goal, uh, we're really punching above our weight for a small Australian company. And we brought you the results of SpaceX's launch of Australia's Spirit CubeSat. It's been an incredible year for Talking Science. My sincerest thanks to Amy and the team at Southern Launch, Cohen and the team at Equatorial Launch Australia, Michelle and Adam at Gilmore Space, James and the incredible comms team at the CSI Road, ASCAP and Australia National Telescope Facility, NASA too for giving me interview time with incredibly busy JPL team members and everyone else that I'm forgetting who have beamed in, signed on and replied to my emails over the past year. With the ratings the way they are for Talking Science, we're going bigger and better next year. The show will be back on the 10th of January. I'm aiming to get back into weekly podcasting. Thanks for your viewership over the year. I'm Matt Miller, and for the final time, this is Talking Science.